Hey guys, Barry here from TGS with another Assassin's Creed Odyssey live stream. Overall, it is number 74. We're going to be focusing on the Discovery Tour. Uh, for those who haven't seen it, I pretty much went through the uh, main game and all the DLC. Uh, sorry for the late start, I might have been 20 seconds late on the intro. Uh, the software said try again, and some kind of like YouTube pop up came up saying to try again, so I had to reload the page, but it seems to be working fine. So I hesitated to start there, but uh, we're going to be playing about two hours, taking probably 20, you know, 20, 25 minute break. I'm guessing today will take a little bit shorter since we're starting late. And then we'll play another two hours. So we're going to do four hours of Assassin's Creed Odyssey Discovery Tour today. If you missed it, we did Call of Duty yesterday and I announced the schedule on the stream for the entire week during part one. I guess I can go over quickly here if we have time. Uh, but plan is for at least Assassin's Creed Odyssey. To finish out Discovery Tour between today and Thursday, we're going to play a total of 8 hours of game time, which seems to be about what it'll take at the most to complete it. You can complete it in like an hour if you skip everything, but we're going to actually watch everything. And uh, it's just going to kind of be like a take it easy week with these game, with this uh, game being a main focus. But next week we'll probably replace this with Destiny 2 if I feel up to it. And then the week after that we'll consider getting in the Ghost Recon Breakpoint. Otherwise for DLC, uh, I can go over the rest of that in just a moment. Start a party. Oh god. We do not need to configure voice overlay. Alright. Let's go over here. Invite only. Actually, let me guys, you know, let me know what you think, guys, about overlay. If I should keep it. Take it off. Like, what you think. I like to put it up because then you know when I'm talking and stuff. In case, especially if the game's getting louder. If we have more than one person. It definitely helps to see who's talking. So I've been trying it solo on a few streams, see how it goes. It's not uh, too obstructive by any means on the stream, so. But usually single player games, I've kept it off. Uh, we'll see if I change my mind uh, in a little bit. But you guys can see right off the bat, I have 1850 out of 1850, 93 out of 93. We've completed all main stories, all side missions. You know, became the top mercenary. There's only a few things we didn't do uh, overall for like a 100% official, do absolutely everything the game has to offer in completion, but. As per achievements, the main story, the side missions, you know, the DLCs in entirety, all completed. So, uh, you get the idea. Played it pretty damn thoroughly. Last stream we did all the flames burn brighter, finishing out the achievements to 1850. We also did uh, some other side mission that didn't have any achievements, but it finished out the Lost Tales of Greece, so check that stream out. Ended up taking uh, a lot longer than initially planned. I thought we were only going to be on for the achieve and I was just like, whatever, let's do the other mission. I like to complete games as close to full as I like to get to. So we officially closed out our playthrough of the main game. So I will probably won't be loading into this. Uh, you guys can see right there, 167 hours, 33 minutes, 57 seconds. So I've, uh, I've spent a lot of time in this. You know, the past, kind of just like uh, Origins did. It's been so long since Origins, I kind of... You move on, especially after 167 hours of Odyssey, Origins becomes a thing of the past. But uh, once we're done Discovery Tour, that's it for this game. I will be playing the next Assassin's Creed. They're going to announce it in February. So definitely uh, stay tuned to see that game on the channel. Uh, before I go, that I'll do really. We got two poll schedule store t-shirts available and two clubs on Xbox, the Gamer Society Fan Club, TJ Screen Chat Club. We also have Patreon memberships, Super Chat, all of our social in the description, as well as a link if you're looking to buy the game. As for the schedule, as mentioned, we had COD yesterday. We usually hold COD and Minecraft together, but we had to hold Minecraft on Sunday night because I couldn't hold two streams yesterday. So we held COD yesterday, Assassin's Creed Odyssey Discovery Tour back to back today. Tomorrow, we're going to have Rage 2 Rise of the Ghost, 2 to 4, 4, 30, 6, 30. At this current time, times may change if we decide, uh, I think we might move our dinner that we had planned tonight for restaurant week uh, to later in the week or just skip it entirely, just not feeling up to it, especially after eating, uh, we uh, split like a 1.5 pound crazy ass top sirloin steak last night and I think we're staked out anyway, so uh, no reason to head out and uh, force it down. So we'll see what happens with that. But uh, just want to throw it out there because the time the time may change on Wednesday or Thursday due to that. Uh, move like 30 minutes earlier at the most. On Thursday, we have Assassin's Creed Discovery Tour, 2 to 4, 4, 30, 6, 30. So like I said, 
either Rage 2 or Assassin's Creed Discovery Tour will get a 30 minute reduction or no change at all. So uh, no game changes or anything like that. We will be holding all four hours per each game. We should finish out Rise of the Ghosts on Wednesday for sure. And I really want to finish out Discovery Tour on Thursday. On Friday, we're going to have Forza Horizon 4, The Eliminator. It's going to be 1.30 to 3.30. We're going to hold Truck Driver 4 to 6. 10.30 to 3 in the morning, we got Flex Scheduling. Uh, no game set in stone yet, but we seem to lean towards Dead by Daylight GTA on Friday night. So, you know, don't be surprised if that's what it is. Just giving a tip to anyone who watches. On Saturday, we have COD Modern Warfare. 1.30 to 3.30, we're going to run Minecraft 4 to 6. Then we're going to run Flex Scheduling 10 to 3 in the morning. Well, 10.30 to 3 in the morning, maybe PUBG and something else. Now Sunday, Overcooked at 5 p.m. ...to embark on a journey of discovery through the rich and fascinating history of classical Greece. You'll become fully immersed in the painstakingly detailed world built for Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which you are free to explore at your own pace, without any danger or time pressure. For a directed experience, take one of the many guided tours curated by prominent historians and archaeologists. Along the way, exchange words with some of Greece's most famous historical persons. The classical Greece you are about to explore is at the peak of its glory. This period is synonymous with grand accomplishments of the physical and the mental. Architectural marvels which still stand today dot its landscape, while towering achievements in philosophy, political systems and art still influence our modern society in profound ways. We hope you become engrossed in the dazzling riches of ancient Greece and welcome you to your visit. Damn. That was a pretty sweet little intro. I'll give them a thumbs up for that. There's 11 tours, 76 discovery sites. So we're going to have a lot to learn over the course of today and Thursday. Uh, we did this for Origins. It was definitely really interesting to learn it all. I'm hoping they improved it a little bit, but uh, made it a little bit easier to get through. That game was definitely fun, but it was all self, you know, it was like kind of self-guided. You had to walk yourself. You didn't have someone walking you around and stuff like that. But we're going to do them all in order, and that's pretty much the plan. After going over schedule, I figured I would just bring up Assassin's Creed Odyssey Discovery Tour goes into Destiny 2, which goes into Ghost Recon Breakpoint. Rage 2, uh, Rise of the Ghost will go into Terra Mania and Star Wars Battlefront 2, which will go into uh, GTA San Andreas. Over the course of the next two weeks, you know, COD, Minecraft, Flex are here to stay. Overcooked will eventually go into Super Mario Bros. on the NES Mini. Uh, let's see, Truck Driver will eventually go into Bus Sim if we decide to get it one day. And Forza Horizon 4 is going to be around for quite some time, so no plans for that right now. But it'll just go to free time, which will go to uh, old school games and stuff like that. You know, stuff we want to play on the side. We'll figure it out when the time comes. As for anything else, uh, Doom Eternal we get in March. You know, Watch Dogs Legion, Dying Light 2 are all postponed. There's no date for Flight Sim yet. Uh, I might get Man Eater in March. I think it's May. Uh, it's just like a little side game where you're a shark and looks pretty crazy. But that's about it. I think we covered everything pretty uh, thoroughly. We got a pack of Sour Patch Kids here for our journey. And, uh, let's see. We pause and like see everything. All right, so here you go. They have the uh, obviously the map. So you can see, you know, you go out some of the islands, not all of them. Sparta's pretty littered. Uh, Athens is littered. I mean, just with the logos, meaning we're got we're gonna learn a lot up here. Kind of. Basically everywhere, and uh, you can see we got the Urban Household Daily Life, we got Daily Life 9 of them, Politics and Philosophy 4, Art, Religion, and Myths 5, Battles and Wars 5, Famous City 7, apparently options. I don't think we need options. I just want, I thought it was specific to the DLC, so I was like, alright. Oh, we can pick any of these people. We gotta be a Greek tough guy, yeah. Oh, you can unlock these? I think you unlock all the characters as uh, you play on. That's pretty cool. You can be part of the cult. It can be Socrates. Procedas. 
we are definitely being a Greek tough guy to start out, and, uh... Let's see. Go with brown Phobos. Change it up. We've been having these fancy horses. We'll go some basic timeline. So here's a timeline, apparently. We have the Bronze Age, the Geometric Period, Archaic Period. Apparently when the, uh... First Olympic Games took place. The known civilization long ago. It's crazy to think that a uh, thousand, three thousand plus years ago, there was all this uh, stuff going on back then. You can just see that statue right there of uh, what they believed in at the time. Definitely be interesting if we had time travel, go uh, take a vacation back in history or something, but. See, so we got the uh, civilization on the bottom, Greco Persian Wars. There's the Peloponnesian War. We have participated in that in the game. There's Pericles on the right. And we don't need controls. <laughs> They give you time, 25 minutes for that one tour, yeah. So, I guess, I guess we'll just do them in order, I mean. We'll just go right down the list. We might as well, uh... Go right down the daily life list. And that's how we'll roll. Alright, so we're here. Let's get started. Greetings, Wanderer. It is my pleasure to introduce you to a unique tour. One that won't take you to impressive landmarks, oh God, look at my dude. battle sites, but through a typical Athenian home. My name is Aspasia. Though I am not originally from Athens, I have climbed to the top of its social ladder using my wits and intellect. I've even earned the love of Pericles, one of the most powerful men in the city. The mind truly is a beautiful thing. If Olibos is Zeus's sanctuary, then my house is my own. It is a place where I can shelter myself from the noise and stress of city life. For an outgoing people like the Greeks, the house was a refuge of privacy. Inside, they could escape from the constant demands of civic life to enjoy the simple pleasures of family life. Look for me when you are done, and we can discuss the things you've seen. Farewell for now. Man, you're ditching me. The house, or oikos, was a residence for Greek families and their slaves. Contrary to modern houses, which look outward, the Greek household was built to look inward on a courtyard. The courtyard was the house's central fixture. It was the building's main source of daylight and also the location of religious altars dedicated to worship. The building itself was made up of familiar accommodations, including bedrooms, storage rooms, a kitchen, and a living room. Women were generally in charge of tending to the home, which in Greece was called oikonomia, a term that inspired the modern word economy.
Dang. Guys of the household. What's that up top? Apparently it's at the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art. That's pretty cool. Did I miss any discovery sites out here? I don't know how much time we'll spend at each individual spot we stop at, guys. But, we're definitely going to look around and see what's up. So that's a real picture right there. It's a lot to read all this and I like, try to comprehend it all, so I try and like you know, skim through it. Usually my goal. You know, let's just continue on with the tour. I don't know if you can just like hop around to all these automatically or how it'll work, but we'll figure it out. We'll grab what we can as we go though. Anything we visibly see nearby. Pasta was a corridor that connected a house's courtyard to its residential section. Archaeological evidence from the city of Olynthos reveals that pastas were added to Greek home design in the 5th century BCE. There's a floor plan right there. That's pretty cool. Oh gosh. There's a lot of info. Foundations of stone with mud bricks and woodwork. So they're packed mud floors. Oh, that sucks. Like, what if it, your house gets wet? Just get mud everywhere? I mean, I guess your floor is made out of mud. So they had couches back then. Interesting. Wonder who uh, decided to invent the couch. This is apparently a floor plan. One is the living room in the top left. Two is are the pastas. Three is the courtyard, which connects to the pasta. Four is the entrance. Five is the kitchen. Six is the, that's. See, it seems like a cool idea, but like every time it rains, you constantly. Uh, open. I don't know. It's cool in concept. I don't know uh, how it would be. But I've never been through a, uh, a rainstorm in a house like this, so I would never know. This is the family altar. So the loo. That's pretty cool.
Every house had an altar. Altar. However you want to say it. I swear, like half, depending where you're in, at in the world, or even just the United States alone, everyone says words differently, so. Just gotta settle on what works for you. I'm not going to read all this, because I, I can't imagine trying to read all this to you guys, so just, you know, feel free to pause it and read as we go. This is your cup of tea. I don't mind going to museums and taking the time to go through it, but at a certain point, your brain starts to just stop to comprehend. That's why we definitely need a break after two hours. No qualms about combining their work and their private lives, and many of them worked from home. Artisans like blacksmiths, sculptors, and potters often had workshops in their houses, some even operated small stores to sell their work. Similarly, doctors were known to treat patients in special offices located in their homes. Women also worked in the house and were responsible for making textiles, as well as producing clothes and supervising weaving, which was carried out by slaves. If the household was wealthy enough, they could even produce a surplus of textiles to sell in times of financial difficulty. So, next is right there. Is there anything back in this room? Let's see what this is. Windows. Pretty interesting. Definitely open air. Person just looking in through the window talking. They're just like, I was walking by, heard your conversation. <laughs> the inner courtyard was the nexus of the house. Functionally, it allowed air to circulate and also provided access to most of the rooms. It also sometimes housed a well or a cistern that collected rainwater. In the center of the courtyard was an altar to Zeus Hercules who served as the protector of the household. Women would often use the space to sew and cook, while children used it as a play area. Furthermore, if the family had pets or animals, the courtyard was where they were allowed to run free. All right, we already did the courtyard one. So we're gonna move over to here. Uh, one second, guys. I thought the stream was freezing for a second. The bathroom was located in the back of the house. Much like today, it was used for cleaning and washing, although the Greeks used chamber pots instead of toilets. Most bathrooms had a luterion that could be filled with water for washing. Mirrors, razors, Strigils and sponges could also be found in the bathroom, along with small vases called arebaloi, which were usually filled with perfume or oil. Sorry about that. I got distracted because I forgot uh, I had to do something on my phone, but it took me 10 seconds, so we're good to go. Let's keep Greek this going. had kitchens where the family's meals were prepared. The Greeks did not often eat meat, except during special occasions like banquets or after sacrifices. They had mainly a grain-based diet, eating staples such as bread, porridge, or a barley cake called maza. They also occasionally ate poultry, fish, and other seafood as well as fruits, vegetables, goat milk and cheese, and olive oil. Food was cooked on a tripod, or sometimes in a klebanos, 
which was a sort of mobile oven. Other cooking implements included braziers, mortars and pestles, a spit to hold food over a fire, platters, and frying pans. The family also used the kitchen to store food in containers called pithoi. That's pretty uh, interesting stuff. I mean, the food doesn't sound too bad for, uh, for what it were, was, man. I like Mediterranean food. Uh, I'm like partially from the Mediterranean, DNA wise, so kind of fits. Hold on, what was back there? I was just making sure we uh, somehow didn't miss another point. Let's continue on. We gotta look around because they hide other points here and there. And you gotta go back and find them, figure, grab them on the way. Symposia were major social institutions in Greece. They were drinking parties held exclusively for men. The party took place in the men's section of the house, the Andron, where residents and guests reclined on special couches called klinai. Food was served on low tables set in front of the couches, while wine was placed in a crater in the center of the room. During a symposium, men drank, sang, had philosophical discussions, and played games like kotobos. Musicians, dancers, and even courtesans were often welcomed to attend as well. However, wives and daughters were always excluded. So that's their man cave, pretty much. <laughs> I like that rug, though. You guys all right? You have too much to drink? What is so funny? My face? This guy I have right now, just he looks crazy. <laughs> the Pyrgos, or upper stories, was the women's quarter of the house, where they could pursue their activities and observe the city without being seen themselves. The rooftops were also used in a special rite called the Adonia, a private celebration held in honor of Adonis, which was reserved for women. At the beginning of spring, women filled terracotta pots with soil and lettuce seeds, then climbed a ladder to place the pots on the rooftop. These pots served as the women's very own Gardens of Adonis. I'm not going to lie, I think, I think the ladies had the hookup, I mean... Uh, the men were downstairs in that little like, little corner room having their drinks, but why the f aren't they up here, you know? <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah, I'd much rather be looking out over this while I'm chilling. Oh, well, they're lost. The ladies knew what was up back then. Master bedroom. We got like a hookah over there or something. Let's see, let's learn more. I got a terracotta plate. Apparently a man laying in his bed, but it looks like it's friggin' like... Man horse with the head... Grown the wrong direction or something. <laughs> but uh, on the left, just some info if you care to read. Like I said, uh, you can always just pause the video if you want to read that info. I kind of just go through it pretty quickly if we actually read everything for the entire stream we'd, our brain would hurt in like two hours I hope you now have a better understanding of the routines and home life of the Greek people what would you like to do next Tour quiz. At the end of each tour, you have the option to take a short, light-hearted quiz. Yeah, we, we gotta take these quizzes. 
take me to the next suggested tour, take me a random tour, that's all. We're probably going to go to the next suggested tour each time, and we'll go through the entire Discovery Tour DLC between today and Thursday, like, up to eight hours of time I think it takes uh, to get through it. Then let's start with a simple question. Which group of people celebrated the Adonia? Uh, it was the women, right? Correct. The Adonia was celebrated by women of all stations. Let's move on to the next question. Oh, we gotta get an A on this quiz, man. Known as the protector of the household. Ooh, Apollo. Apollo Patros was believed to be the father of the Ionian Greeks. Keep trying, though. Ah. Uh, right, one of the Zeus's. Yes. There we go. Kios protected the household, and an altar to the god usually stood in the center of the house's courtyard. On to the final question. Which of the following was not located in the bathroom? Oh man, we're gonna either fail or get a D on this one. Yeah, 66% or a 33. Oh, you need to repeat that for me. Which of the following was not located in the oh, bathroom? Oh god. I, I don't know. Look at my dude. Does he look like he knows? We don't know the answer. <laughs> Shout out to J-Smoke. Oh, what? Which of the following was not located, not located in the bathroom? There was no mirrors, were there? I'm afraid mirrors were quite common in bathroom. Uh, Keep trying. I didn't see it. I didn't look for it. I don't know what this stuff is. Lutirion, Clubanos, Strigils. Oh, God. The Lutirion was a water basin that was located in the bathroom. Try a different answer. Well, at least we're learning while we get the wrong answer. Correct. The Clevanos was a mobile oven usually found in the kitchen. The Clevan. How the hell is I going to remember that, man? <laughs> well done, Wanderer. Throwing like a textbook at me in like 30 minutes. I'm not going to remember it. Farewell, Wanderer. And thank you. I was going to do the next one, but I want to look around make sure we get all the... Uh, you got discovery sites and tours. I want to see is like is there any other discovery sites around here? Can I climb like an assassin? I can. I don't see anything. Let's go over this way. Actually, I'm not going to lie. Imagine this game without the assassin thing in it. Just, instead of being an assassin, you just lived in ancient Greece. And it was like a ancient Greek life simulator, and you could, like, pick a... You had to be born and, like, go through, uh, like, schooling and stuff, and go down a certain path and, like, become, you know, a blacksmith or this or that, and, like, you worked your way up in your career and stuff. And you make, uh, life decisions... You can, like, have a family, and then one day you grow old and die, like, legit. You have to, like, try and do the most you can. I, I would play that game. Yeah, I'd be running around like this dude the whole time, trying to do as much as I could in that time period. But <laughs> I think it'd be, just throwing it out there, I think it'd be a cool idea. They're making some game where you grow old and die, but I haven't heard about that in a long time. Oh, we got a new character selection. We got Blacksmith. It's Phoebe. Yeah, I can't play as Phoebe. Phoebe died. What the f game? You're rubbing it in, man. It's not cool. We're going to learn all about wine, because, I mean, who the hell doesn't want to learn about wine? Let's hop into the wine. See what's going down. It's kind of the order they're doing it in. I think they just they recommend the order that it's in, basically, instead of hopping around. So we'll just follow right through the household. But uh, at the two hour mark on the stream, we're going to take up to 30 minutes, but probably between 20 and 25, and then we'll play another two. Then on Thursday, uh, we'll do two 30 minute break, too. So we'll see if eight hours is enough to get this done. I guess today we'll get a good idea, you know. We'll see what we get done in two hours, what we get done in four hours of game time, and uh, that'll give me an estimate of what to expect. There's also estimated times everywhere, so. We have four discovery sites uh, in this region. Let's go ahead and meet. Whoever this is. Ah, my friend. Oh my God, it's Marcos. I to run into you in this most intoxicating place. 
I'd offer you a drink, but uh, for some reason the workers won't let me borrow any of their wine, cheapskates. Why, I'm Marcos, of course, one of the most successful merchants in all of Greece. You really haven't heard of me? My name <laughs> is known from Kefalonia to Kos. If you've ever paid money for something, I probably received a percentage. But enough about me. Let's go back to what you're doing here. You know, I once started my own wine business on Kos. It uh, hit a bit of a snag when my investors, three brothers calling themselves the Cerberos, suddenly lost faith in me. But after they had a tragic run-in with a bloodthirsty Mystheos, I was able to land on my feet. From then on, the streets of Kos overflowed with wine, and my purse overflowed with drag me. Very sad about the Cerberus, though. Couldn't have happened to nicer people. As you can probably tell by all the grapes, this is one of Greece's many vineyards. Wine was an essential part of Greek culture, and this tour will take you through how it was made. In addition to being delicious, not to mention lucrative, wine was an important part of Greek economy. I promise I'll meet you at the end of your visit, my friend. See you soon! Shout out to Jordan in chat. What is up, Jordan? Welcome to the stream. They're just doing Discovery Tour. It's like the official last thing I have to do in Assassin's Creed Odyssey for 100% completion to my extent of what I plan to do. Like, I'm not going to go back and uh, waste my time on certain things like the uh, the treasure hunts because the treasure hunts never gave me anything good, so I didn't bother to do them. But that's something I missed out on. And the uh, What's the other thing I missed out on? We skipped out on something else too, but we'll see what happens. Winemaking dates back to the 4th or 3rd millennium BCE. It became widespread in Greece during the Bronze Age, and within centuries the Greeks had refined it further. The first step in the process was always harvesting, where grapes grown on rows of vines were collected by vineyard workers. According to Homer, harvesting was often accompanied by music to give it a more festive atmosphere. Ancient Greek wine mainly came in three different varieties, Osteros, Glucotzion, and Autocratos. It could be flavored with spices, herbs, resin, and even perfume. It was also much stronger <laughs> than wine, with an alcohol percentage of approximately 16%. Because of this, yeah, some good wine. the drink was mixed with water to make it more palatable. Oh, mixed with water, gosh damn it. Man! Ruining the wine. I think Jay Smoke went to get a snack or something, man. ...sweetness and prevent it from turning into vinegar. In most vineyards, the drying process involved laying the grapes out on the ground under the heat of the sun, then covering them at night to protect them from accumulating dew. According to Hesiod's poem, Works in Days, the ideal time to dry grapes was ten days and ten nights. When they were finally completely dried, the grapes were collected in jars, just as they are today. Damn. All that wine. I'll help you out a little bit. <laughs> I'm gonna stop my feet. Your grapes. My stinky feet and your grapes, boy. <laughs> oh, God. You yeah, can't ruin wine with that, I thought. Definitely not what you want. <laughs> the Greeks had many methods for crushing the harvested grapes. The most common technique was to use a lenos, a large treading vat, where workers stomped on grapes with their feet. Alternatively, the Greeks sometimes crushed the grapes by hand using a strainer, mash them with a mortar and pestle, or squeeze them using a tool called a sack press. After the grapes were pressed, the resulting juice was poured into large containers called pithoi, where it fermented. 
Once fully fermented, the wine was filtered through an ethmos, or sac, which separated it from the residual yeast called lees. The wine was then placed in a special storage room. The room was half buried to keep it dry and maintain a consistent temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. These measures ensured the wine wouldn't lose any of its quality before being shipped to market. So we got a uh, Rodian Terracotta Transport Amphora with stamps on the upper part of the handles. It's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, apparently. That'd be crazy, yeah. Just somehow come upon something like this old and just have it in your house or something. <laughs> Can't imagine what its value is. After the grapes were pressed, the resulting juice. Oh god! I thought they meant play like an audio to the picture. I don't want to hear the whole thing again. Let's go ahead and move on. When the wine was ready to ship. It was poured into storage containers called M4. These were smaller than Pithoi, which made them easier to ship and display in crowded marketplaces. However, that doesn't mean transporting wine was always a safe endeavor. Sometimes ships carrying amphoras as cargo would be wrecked before making it to their destination, losing hundreds of bottles of wine to the sea. Uh, yeah, definitely answer, uh, Jordan. <laughs> Yeah, Jay Smoke, uh, you got that video up last night, pretty much. Uh, yeah, before I forget answer uh j smoke i did p take a peek at your video man i should i dropped the like so it should be there yeah definitely probably in the millions i definitely can't disagree with that what are these With knowledge? I hope you enjoyed yourself learning about all the picking, stomping, and bottling that goes into making Greece's favorite beverage. Maybe if my customers understood how hard winemaking was, they'd agree more with my perfectly reasonable prices. But let's talk about something else, yes? What else can I do for you? You want your intelligence tested? Oh God, here we go. Let me tell you, my friend, no one is more qualified for that task than me. Let's get started. What container was used to ship wine to the market? Oh God. An ethmos was actually a strainer, not a container. Although both words end in aner. So I learned the process, but I don't remember the actual word. Again. Yes. Wine there we go. That was my second journey. choice. Long journey to market. Here's another question. Which of the following wasn't a type of wine variety? No, there was Thesos. No, Afstiros was a dry kind of wine. Try again. No, Aftokrator was wine of the medium sweet variety. But don't give up yet. Uh, I'm going to try this one. Glicazon was the sweetest type of wine. And my personal... What the hell, man? I thought the other one was a wine. Correct answer. Try another one. Gotta pay better attention. Correct. Thassos was an island famous... Ah, oh, Thassos was the island with the vineyard. Man. Just one more question to go, my friend. 
Which part of the winemaking process created the grape juice? Oh man, they're gonna ask me these hard words again. Oh, so what did it say? Which part of the winemaking process created the grape juice necessary for wine? Nothing about shipping, nothing about harvesting. I mean, the grape juice you got through pressing, I guess. That's the one. The harvested grapes were pressed in a linos, often by the feet of vineyard workers. Just try not to think about that last part whenever you have a cup of wine. You know your wine. You're as good with facts as I am with money, and that's really saying something. If you say so, my friend, I hope we see each other again soon. I think I just got a package, guys. Let me see. Yeah, I got a package. I'll deal with it in a moment. I wouldn't recommend that to answer J Smoke because it restricts your comments. Uh, you can get in trouble if you post something. Even if you say one curse word and you put it for kids, it can be problematic, man. I would definitely, uh, I would stay clear of making content for kids, but it's up to you. Wine falsification. So that says Heracleon. Imitation wines, man, come on. Three more spots to discover here or something. So I'm currently looking around to see where they're at. Oh, I see two more. Can they fast travel these? That's pretty awesome that you've seen it in the museum. And uh, that's pretty cool to answer chat. I was trying to reach chat, walk, you know, walk in the walls over here, but uh. I haven't been to uh, a lot of the stuff in the games in like New York museums, but I haven't been to New York museums in a long time. So. It's pretty cool though, we can like come in here and look around and not get in trouble for it. I was trying to get like a picturesque view of it. But uh, the, I should have turned off the grid lines. We could have shown you a better view of inside of there. But so this is where we want to go. Over there.
honestly, I like this idea and all, but if I was actually going to learn this stuff, I think I prefer just to sit back and let, and not have to do anything except just watch and learn. Having to go around and find this stuff while, is it's kind of annoying in a sense, because I've already played this game 160 plus hours, I, I really don't want to run around looking for stuff. But I do want to see what you have to learn from it. Drag me. I have like a mini collection of coins. It'd be amazing to have something like this. I don't want to take a picture here. Come on. There's way better spots than that game. Only one more discovery site to tackle around here somewhere. I'm pretty sure one of the tours is going to be like an island hopping tour. Honestly, is my guess. I don't know where the next one is. It doesn't really show it. I'll see a fourth discovery tour. Well, let's travel down there. Oh, definitely. Answer chat, be crazy. Actually, uh, if you go on eBay, you can get a uh, ancient room and coin. It may not be the best quality, but it seems like between seven and like twenty bucks. No lie, I'm sure if you want to get like a really, really good quality coin, it's probably going to cost you thousands. But. Yeah, like really good coins easily. Ever. There's a coin for $17,000 on eBay from Ancient Room right now. Holy shit. $12,500. That'd be amazing. <laughs> just have that kind of money to just buy a coin with it. Ah, just another day. $12,000 coin. Here's a bunch of flags. Obviously, they're not real. So each of the 27 regions, color and icon, iconography of the region. Interesting. Pretty cool concept. And yeah, definitely the answer, Jordan. 
if I were had that kind of funds to throw away like that, uh, yeah, I definitely wouldn't. I'd be going through like some crazy top end. Yeah, you call you go through like Sotheby's or some shit. <laughs> you definitely don't go on eBay, spend ten grand on a coin. So uh, the next one is the life of a Greek woman. Six stations, thirteen minutes. So let's go ahead and learn what women were doing back in ancient Greece. Let's get started. Welcome to Corinth, Wanderer. I have a special visit planned for you today. It's an intimate, informative look into the daily lives of Greek women. It's amazing what women could accomplish while men spend all day trying to out-debate each other at assembly meetings. Their work should be far more appreciated on the whole, but we're going to acknowledge that now. Corinth was one of the largest cities in ancient Greece. It had an estimated population of 90,000 in my times, and much of that population was made up of women. This tour will shine a light on those women and look at how they lived on a day-to-day -day basis. Look for me when you're done with your visit, and we can discuss things further. Are right, we gonna get ready for the quiz, guys? It's almost time for our quiz. Young girls growing up in ancient Greek cities were usually raised by a nurse. They mostly stayed in the women's quarters of the house, the gunaikon, where they spent their time spinning threads and weaving. While there is not much historical evidence of young girls at play, especially compared to boys, it was still known to happen. For example, an ancient terracotta group depicts two girls playing ephedrismos. This was a competition to see who could strike an upright rock from afar using a pebble or ball. The game's loser had to close their eyes and carry the victor until they managed to touch the same rock with their hands. apparently. For a young Greek woman, marriage was the culmination of their induction into society. The average life expectancy for women was about 40 years, so most marriages took place when the bride was 14 or 15 years old. The marriage did not require her consent either. 
Instead, she was passed on from the protection of her father to that of her husband. Married women were not technically citizens at the time and lacked the rights that came with official citizenship. However, they did receive a dowry that only they were allowed to spend. But in the event of a failed marriage, the dowry was returned to the bride's father. After the marriage was consummated, the woman's status changed from being a maiden to a bride. She remained a bride until the birth of her first child, wherein she officially became a woman. Terracotta doll. Damn. Crazy. Check this one here. Dang, that's messed up story. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Average lifetime was friggin' half of today. Honestly, at that point, I'd be almost three quarters to the end of my life, so. <laughs> Not cool, man. That'd be fin ridiculous. Women living in ancient Greek cities were essentially forbidden from participating in political life, and most aspects of their lives were controlled by men. Their most important responsibilities were running the household and giving birth to children, preferably boys. Most of the time, women's excursions outside of the house were limited to visiting other female neighbors, as per custom. The few exceptions to this strict rule were weddings, funerals, and religious festivals involving women in prominent public roles. Damn. Just, I feel like the vibe of what they're teaching here was definitely not depicting in the game. Like, uh, it didn't seem like uh, everything was so strict back then to what you're learning here. Making textiles was the main occupation of most Greek women. It was a woman's responsibility to manufacture clothing for each of her family members, as well as to weave other household textiles. Women with exceptional weaving skills were believed to make excellent wives, and weaving in general was seen as a very attractive quality. For example, Homer describes Odysseus's devoted wife Penelope as spending most of her days weaving at the loom. Similarly, many Greek vases depicting women weaving were combined with images of a woman holding a veil, which was seen as the symbol of a bride. Let's see. Woman working at a loo from the Metropolitan Museum of Art.
ancient Greek women cooked in their house's kitchen area. However, since their cooking equipment was small and portable, they also sometimes prepared meals in the central courtyard. This was also where women performed other domestic activities. These activities were rarely seen by visiting men or passers-by because the architecture of classical Greek houses facilitated the social norm that women should never be seen at work. <laughs> that, that's funny in chat. I can't imagine weaving being an attractive feat, but I'm also uh, 3,000 years ahead of the time, I guess. Times change pretty drastically. Think about 100 years ago, 300 years ago, think about 3,000 years ago. Life was a whole, a whole new world. The historian Strabo relays that the Temple of Aphrodite was one of Corinth's most famous landmarks. This was largely due to the temple's female patrons. These Hittirai, as they were called, were donated to the goddess by both men and women. According to Strabo, the Temple of Aphrodite contributed greatly to Corinth's wealth. The Hittirai were the temple's main attraction, and many visitors came to Corinth in search of their company, for which they spent frequently and frivolously. Oh god, it's time for our quiz, guys. I'm scared. I'm getting like D's. <laughs> no more D's, man. I'm gonna have that 1.0 GPA on this Hello, DLC. I hope your visit was an interesting one. Greek women lived very restricted lives compared to men, but throughout it all, they held on to their strength and dignity. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Feeling up for a test? Excellent! Let's begin with an easier question. What was the name of the women's quarters in a Greek home? Uh. The Iraeon was a temple dedicated to the goddess Hera. Try again. Oh man, we're already off to a fail. The Andron was actually the men's... I thought the Andron was the men's, but I was like, I'm gonna try it. Try another answer. Correct. The Yinecon was where young Yinecon. girls spent their days weaving and spinning threads. On to the next question. The Corinthian temple said to employ the Etera was dedicated to which god? Missed out on that question. The Corinthian temple said to employ the Etera was dedicated to which god? Ah, uh, we just learned about that. Probably Athena or Aphrodite. We'll say Aphrodite. Correct. Aphrodite was the goddess of love and passion, so it's only fitting her temple served such an amorous purpose. We're almost done. Just one more question. What was the name of Odysseus's wife? <laughs> I see you in chat. Uh, I think the, the stream's delayed like 15 seconds, so I'm like done answering it when you see it. I missed out on the question again because I was reading chat. Odysseus's wife. Odysseus' wife? Oh, that's easy. It's Penelope. Yes, Penelope was Odysseus's loyal wife, who kept at her weaving while waiting for her husband to return from war. You passed the test, Wanderer. Congratulations. Then farewell, Wanderer, and thank you for visiting this great place. <laughs> Apollo. Man, you would've got me wrong, man. <laughs> the hell, man? So over here is a different tour. Over here is another different tour. to do the tours and then do these things after we do all the tours. Uh, I'm starting to wonder if we should just do tours and then at the end of the tours we go around and we get all the discovery sites done.
Otherwise, we got far to go. Let's look at the tours. We can actually get an estimate of how long this is going to take us, I think. It's 30 minutes there, 45, an hour, an hour, 15, hour and a half. It's like two hours, 15 minutes with all that. Like three hours, 25 minutes with that, and then you still have all this. Basically have five hours at that point, including all the traveling and stuff at the min. Six hours. It's six to seven hours, so eight hours is a pretty good estimate for uh, what I'm thinking will take, because... Uh, that does, I don't think that includes like doing all the other stuff, like exploring around, which should take an hour or two to do. You can usually just fast travel around and then just ride your horse around and stuff. So they're actually recommending I go to the Acropolis of Athens instead of hopping into the next daily life, which is Bronze and Argos. We're going to go ahead and uh, follow their suggested tour here. Uh, thanks, Jordan. Appreciate uh, trying to help. Thankfully, I got it. <laughs> Passed that test, man. I don't think they even keep track or anything like that. Imagine there being an achievement. You know, get like a get an A in the A on the entire test. So we got 11 tours. I know, that's in the whole game. I thought it was in the region. So we, we're at an hour 12 minutes. We got about 45 minutes till a break. So we're going to take the break around. What would that put us at? Like 420 or something like that. We'll be taking a break. So let's go ahead and do this. So in nine stations, we're going to explore the Acropolis of Athens. Greetings, Wanderer. And welcome to the Acropolis. The shining Acropolis. jewel of Athens. Personally, I think the Acropolis is one of, if not the, greatest place in all of Greece. Though, considering it was the project of my partner, Pericles, I may be a touch biased. The Acropolis of Athens is a bastion of art and culture worthy of the gods themselves. Within this citadel, you will find many important sacred buildings, as well as some of the most magnificent art in all of Greece. You are in for a very enlightening visit. When you're done, come find me, and we can discuss the things you have seen. Oh, man. Now. Another quiz. <laughs> started the acropolis has gone through many changes in its long history it began as a simple rock was settled as early as the neolithic period and then became a fortress in the mycenaean period stone buildings started appearing in the 7th century bce but the famous structures whose ruins remain visible today date mainly from a period of construction in the 5th century bce the location of the Acropolis is closely tied with Athens' foundation myth. Supposedly, it was the site where Athena and Poseidon competed for the city's patronage. This connection gave the Acropolis a sacred aura, and it was considered the religious heart of the city. Watch out, Demon Tour. <laughs> Damn. Looking pretty good. 
check out this painting. Oh, that's a real deal. Pope Eli. Damn. Seeing the real deal. Or is that a painting? I can't really tell. Like the building in the back right almost looks like it's photoshopped in or something, but a lot of it looks pretty real. Man, they never finished it. Dang, Peloponnesian War, what the f man? The Temple of Athena Nike was built on the remains of old fortifications from the Mycenaean era. Worship at the temple can be traced back to the 6th century BCE. But the building itself was destroyed during the Greco-Persian Wars a century later. It was rebuilt during the Peloponnesian War. Given that the name Athena Nike roughly means Athena of Victory, it was likely constructed in the hopes that Athens would win the war. Unusually, the temple depicts historical scenes of battles against the Persians instead of the more mythologically inclined art of other Greek buildings. The temple's priestess was chosen randomly among the Athenians and received a salary of 50 drachmae annually, along with skins and trophies from sacrificed animals. Dang. The Acropolis was built up over a long period due in no small part to its partial destruction during the Greco-Persian Wars. It was in the 5th century BCE, though, that the Acropolis received its most significant improvements. This period was an extremely prosperous time for Athens, both financially and culturally. With a booming economy bolstered by trade and the Lavrion silver mines, Pericles, the leader of Athens, financed a huge project to rebuild the citadel. He enlisted the help of renowned artists, like the sculptor Phidias, as well as the architects Ictinos, and together, they erected buildings like the Parthenon and the Propylia Gateway. Heracles' goal was to make the Acropolis into a glorious monument to the gods and to mortal Athenians. Let's move up. I think I see a few spots we can go to, so let's check them out. Athena. Here's the priest house. Damn. 
giant statue. Behind the Propylaia was the giant bronze statue of Athena Promachos, or Athena who fights on the front lines. That name was reflected in the spear and shield the statue held in its hands. It was erected in the mid-5th century BCE by the artist Phidias. According to an inscription, it took nine years to make and cost almost half a million drachmae. At approximately 10 meters tall, the statue was apparently so large that Pausanias claimed its helmet and spear tip could be seen from the sea near Cape Sunion, 60 kilometers away. The ornamentation on the statue's shield was engraved by the metalsmith, Nice. <laughs> the Arephoroi were young girls between the ages of 7 and 11 who were in charge of special rights. A list of four girls was drafted by the Assembly of Citizens, from which the High Magistrate, the Archon Basileus, chose two to serve as Arephoroi for the year. The girls lived in a house on the Acropolis. They were in charge of carrying sacred objects and weaving the peplos of Athena. The peplos was a sacred robe offered to Athena during Panathenea, a festival held in her honor. So they're just like, all right, you're leaving your home and coming with us? <laughs> Live here now? And the olive tree of Athena. Let's learn some more about it. Hold on. I read the thing, but I didn't look at the coin. Is that the tree? Oh, there's a tree on the coin. Bronze coin depicting Athen of Athens depicting Athena. The Erechtheon was an atypical temple. It was dedicated not only to Athena Pelias, but also to Kekrops, the mythical founder of Athens, his son Erechtheos, and even Poseidon, the sea god who challenged Athena for possession of the city. The temple, the eastern part housed a statue dedicated I didn't to skip Athena, it, so you guys know. while the western section jointly belonged to Poseidon and Erechtheos. Meanwhile, King Kekrop's grave was believed to be under the caryatid porch. Under the temple was a crypt that was said to contain the sacred snakes of Athena. The snakes may have had a sweet tooth because the priestesses of Athena allegedly fed them honey cakes. There it is, the real deal. View from the southwest. Let's check out what it has to say and then we'll look at the picture. The erect there we go hit the wrong button there it is it looks pretty uh it's pretty wild the deck is still there and stuff i went to uh rome for those who don't know in like november and saw a lot of really really old stuff so it'd definitely be cool to see this kind of stuff because uh this one's really holding up pretty well obviously it's down but compared to some of the stuff i've seen 
it was that's this old not only to Athena Pelias, definitely a different ball game under the snakes me all right that's enough Let's see what this one is the altar of Athena They slaughtered a hundred cattle on this thing. Here's another one. There's the ox sacrifice right in front of the altar. Going around this way, make sure we're, yep, there's some over here. She wasn't allowed to eat cheese? What the f man? My guess is we're going to end up going in there, but I wanted to check if there was any of the other ones. The Parthenon is one of the most well-known buildings in the world and an enduring symbol of ancient Greek civilization. While it is located on the Acropolis, the building is not a traditional temple. 
It was built by the sculptor Phidias and the architects Callicrates and Ictinus as a great monument to the glory of the city of Athens. That glory is evident in its many carvings. One of the most carved monuments in Greek architecture, the Parthenon's decorations depict several mythological scenes. These include the birth of Athena, her fight against Poseidon for the patronage of Athens, the gods' battle with the giants, and the procession of the great Panathenaea. Let's go ahead and go in. Two more tour stations. We're almost done with this one. Then we'll hop into another one. We still have uh, just another 30 minutes. I'm already going to fail this quiz, so we don't have to worry about it. There, there's so much information, guys. It's not like I'm in a class where I have time to try and like relearn the info that I don't remember. Contained Just thrown right in the test. Of Athena ...that was considered to be one of the sculptor Phidias's greatest masterpieces. The statue was chryselephantine, a combination of gold and ivory. To justify the steep cost of its construction, Pericles told Athenians that the statue was a gold reserve which could be disassembled in times of economic distress. The cella also allegedly contained a pool whose main purpose was to control the room's humidity, which helped preserve the statue's ivory. It's a lot off an ivory. All the drawings on the walls. Terracotta picture here. There's a prize amphora for uh, storing olive oil, apparently. Interesting. Apparently we're on the way to the final station. Athens' treasury was located in the Parthenon, where it was believed to be protected by Athena herself. The treasury contained objects of great value, acquired from different conquests, as well as a mass of minted silver coins and various offerings to Athena. Heracles also decided to move the entirety of the Delian League's treasure to the Parthenon in 454 BCE. This was a great testament to Athens' power over the rest of Greece. The riches were divided into two parts, the Demosia, which belonged to the city, and the Hiera Cremita, which was dedicated to the goddess and only used for religious purposes. Damn, oh god. That's what I'm worried about. Peace out, Jordan. Thanks for watching, man. Definitely appreciate you hanging out. Take our quiz. Of the Acropolis. It truly is quite something, isn't it? A sacred sanctuary and an architectural marvel, all in one. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. It's not like you really allow me to ask many questions. You're confident enough for a test? Very well. Let us see how much you know.
Nothing. Which two gods competed for Athens' patronage? It's definitely uh, Poseidon and Athena. Correct. It was Poseidon and Athena who fought for Athens' patronage. As for who won, the answer is in the city's name. On to the next question. Who sculpted the statue of Athena in the Parthenon? I think it was Phidias. Correct. The renowned sculptor Phidias made the statue, which was considered one of his masterpieces. And now, the final question. Which king's tomb was believed to be under the Cariatid porch? I think it was Kekrops. That is correct. Kekrops yeah, three for three. King of Athens, and his tomb was said to be under the Erechtheion. It seems you know much about this place. Well done, wanderer. Thank you, thank you. So for now. As you wish. Hopefully we will see each other again soon. Covered like four tours so far. Six stations, 20 minutes. This sounds like almost perfect for what we need, to be honest. Oh god. There's there's things everywhere here, guys. Like I th I'd say a good majority of the ones in the game are in these cities. That's why I'm saying I think we should do discovery tours and then do discovery sites. I think we should slam out the tours and then we can run through all the sites. It'll be a lot, you know, easier that way. It's just, it feels too messy doing one, then flipping back, one, and then flipping back. So we're going to go ahead and go to the next tour, which is a, a different town, apparently. They're kind of just taking us all over the place. We're going to follow it, though. We're probably going to stay live during the break and play it even longer, guys. So. It's going to be crazy. I remember starting to think it would have been smarter to, to not play an Assassin's Creed back to back these days. But uh, too late now. After playing it, I'm not really in the mood for anything else. I mean, the options would have been like Forza Truck Driver and Rage 2. I'm definitely not in the mood for Forza Truck Driver today and Rage 2. I'm just not in the mood because I'm not prepared. So we're going to do Assassin's Creed back to back today and Thursday. But it's a lot of information to digest in a two hour period before a break. Shout out to Jay Smoke. Welcome back. You just missed out. Jordan left out. But, uh,. Welcome back, man. We're going to go ahead and hop into the final tour of the half, and then we'll go ahead and uh, take a break for like 20, 30 minutes, and then we'll continue on for another like two hours-ish. Somewhere in there. So let's hop in. Welcome, traveler, to the ruins of Mykine. My name is Herodotus, and I am a traveler from Harikanassus. I retrace the cause of various events, such as wars and great calamities. I describe what I see and record what I'm told, all with the aim of providing a better understanding of why these things occur. Look for me to introduce you to many sites. It is humbling to stand in the remnants of such a great civilization. Looking at these ruins, I am reminded that the past is never as far behind us as we think. These are the ruins of Mykine, center of the old Mykinian civilization. It was home to great warriors and heroes. In many ways, places like Athens and Sparta stand on the shoulders of its accomplishments. This tour will take you through its ruins and introduce you to its most important monuments. Revealing its history in the process. I hope you enjoy yourself. I'll be waiting for you at the end of your visit. Oh man, another qu another quiz. Is it a quiz? But I got A on the last quiz. <laughs> the Mycenaean civilization flourished in the late Bronze Age, between 1600 and 1200 BCE. During this period. It was mainly located in the Peloponnese and central Greece. Mycenaeans were known for exploring distant lands. Notably, they battled the Hittite allied city of Walusa. 
in a conflict that was believed to be the inspiration for Homer's Trojan War. Damn. The Athenian people didn't only travel to fight. They learned much from their neighbors, the Minoans of Crete, such as how to write syllabic script on clay tablets. Such tablets provide evidence that Mycenaeans spoke an early form of Greek. They also tell of how great Mycenaean kings ruled over their warriors from opulent palaces in places like Mycenae, Thebes, and Knossos. Damn, all over the island. Well, let's go back. Uh, there was an option to learn more. Let's see what it was. Mycenae. Here's to learn more. There's a chariot, apparently. Indians were known for exploring. No, but this. We should just let me review the extra info, but we gotta speed through. We heard the rest. Next one. The entrance to Agamemnon's citadel, or the Lion Gate, is one of the most iconic monuments in Mycenae. It is impressive for both its height and for the intimidating rendering on its relief, which depicts two lions standing on either side of a column. Unfortunately, the lions' heads, which were presumably made of a precious metal or higher quality stone, have been lost to time. The gate was most likely meant to greet a triumphant king returning home from successful military campaigns and to awe foreign visitors. Man, I did it again. Sorry, guys. If I skipped any during the previous ones, I'm really sorry about that. I've been trying to look at these for every single stop. You know, if we miss one or two, it, you know, it is what it is. Sometimes we make a mistake. But I'm going to try and show as many of these as I can. So here we have the Lion Gate. This is the actual gate itself in real life, so it's, it's high text. Can not zoom in on it? Meh. The doll or the lion gate. It is a, the gate. Let's not make that mistake again. Two times in a row is enough. Moving on. Gotta make sure we see whatever it shares. When these shafts were discovered by archaeologist Heinrich Schliemann in 1876, he believed the six gold-filled graves to be connected with the family of the great king Agamemnon, even going so far as to proclaim a gold mask he found within to be the death mask of Agamemnon. However, this was refuted by later excavations, which showed that the 19 bodies buried in the shafts dated back to a few hundred years before Agamemnon was even born. In fact, at the time of the body's burial, the Lion Gate and the Citadel Walls had not even been built yet. It's estimated that the people in the graves were members of the first Mycenaean dynasty. The graves later became a place of worship for Mycenaean kings who raised walls to protect them. These walls helped preserve several incredible artifacts, including women's jewelry, death masks, and masterfully crafted weapons. Shout out to Cam, Sir JK, Chase, and Chat. What is up? Jay Smoke was here. I think he's still here, if I'm not mistaken. We have three more stations. And then I'm going to make sure we get everything else around. But we should be going on break so everyone knows in like 15 minutes max, which is probably going to be at the end of this uh, story, plus checking the around. Like, see the purple thing up there? We got to go see those as well. By 1250 BCE. Mycenae was at the height of its power, and its living quarters and workshops were numerous. Houses were built everywhere, from the top of the palace's hill near the king's residence, to the slopes and terraces within the walls, to the nearby hills outside the citadel. At one point, the citadel's walls even had to be enlarged to make room for more quarters. The people who lived inside the citadel were those with high status in either the military, religious, or administrative sectors of the kingdom. This is reflected by the ceramic and metal vessels inside the houses, as well as their painted plastered walls.
Sorry about going quiet, guys. Uh, Electra just called me. Uh, we had that reservation at like a steakhouse tonight, but neither of us are feeling like going, especially because we uh, had steak last night. So apparently they got a new spot open. It's like booked out because it's restaurant week, thirty-five bucks for uh, appetizer, dinner plus dessert. And the app, the actual, the actual uh, dinner is like friggin' steak, like fourteen ounce New York strip, eight ounce filet mignon and stuff. So usually those themselves cost like sixty bucks. So we figured we would go. But that works out. So maybe uh, tomorrow we'll consider changing the stream times by 30 minutes, but it's not set in stone yet. We'll decide later. But uh, all the streams will stay as is, just Wednesday or Thursday. We might go from 2 to 4, 4 to 6, 30 to 1 to 3, 30, 3, 4 to 6 to make up for it. But here is the general view of Mycenae currently. Yeah, it obviously didn't hold, off, hold over too well. This kind of reminds me of Rome. They'd be like, oh, this is the location of Palatine Hill. And then this is pretty much what would be there, just ruins. Which is kind of expected, but uh, it'd be awesome to actually see what it looked like at the time. Could be earthquakes, barbarous Dorians, drought and famine, trade disruption, revolts. So they're all just burned down. So they must have been invaded. Got invaded and burned down, pretty much, is what it sounds like. <laughs> yeah, this character looks pretty wild. He's, uh, you pick random characters for your playthrough of this. It's not the same as the story. You just use whoever you want. And you unlock more people by going through it. It's literally just like educational gaming. But, uh, I don't mind it. I like learning about stuff. Not that I'm going to remember half of the crap we're learning. It's not crap, but you know what I'm saying. And uh, there's so much information we're learning. It's just your brain is a sponge, but you know eventually that sponge gets full of uh, full, and you're not gonna pick up anything else. And that, that's literally how it's gonna be by the end of today's stream. A traveler seeking an audience with the king would have first ascended a steep ramp from the Lion Gate to the Citadel's summit. Here, they would have walked into the palatial complex through a grand entrance called the Propylon. Once inside, their gaze would immediately be drawn to the palace's main hall, a monumental area known as the Megaron. The vividly decorated Megaron, which glittered with precious objects and colorful frescoes in its heyday, was where the king would have received the If the king was feeling generous, he would have shared with the visitor the palace's most marvelous feature, its commanding and majestic view which stretched from the plain of Argolis to the gleaming Aegean Sea. Damn. It was in this palace where a legendary Mycenaean king like Agamemnon would have held court. According to Homer and other poets, Agamemnon led the Greeks in the sack of Troy. Stories say that he was a fearsome warrior on par with Achilles, but also an overly ambitious and arrogant ruler. He sacrificed his own daughter, Ephigenia, to convince Artemis to grant his ships passage to Troy. After conquering the city, he returned to Mycenae with mounds of riches and a Trojan named Cassandra as his concubine. Agamemnon's wife, Clytemnestra, was not pleased with her husband's sacrifice of their daughter. She plotted to murder her husband out of anger. The plot was successful, and, depending on the version of the story, Agamemnon was either murdered in his bath by Clytemnestra or killed by his cousin Agisthus during a banquet. So here's the uh, picture of the quarrel between Agamemnon and Achilles. Achilles. So easy to butcher all these names. Here's the picture. Apparently it shows the transcript too. Interesting. Yeah, 
Yeah, definitely to answer uh, Captain Surge. That's why I like going through these. You learn all this different stuff. This game's really detailed as well. If you ever get a chance to play like Origins or Odyssey, two of the best. I mean, Assassin's Creed did a great job of depicting places for a long time. So I mean, it's definitely worth a check out if you haven't played it ever before. You've completed <laughs> No notes. I trust it was an eye-opening experience, though it did not last. If I was taking a class online, man, I'd take notes for sure, but I wouldn't mind taking history classes online or something on the side. Just I got way more important courses to be taking right now. Only to avoid repeating their mistakes. Now, what else? I think it'd be cool just learning something, learn about like ancient Rome or something for a class or something. Then let's begin. First, I have quite a simple question. Probably gonna fail this quiz. Ancient city may have been the inspiration for Homer's depiction of Troy. No, the Meginians who were at war with Troy in the first place. Uh, and Wilusa? Yes, the Meginians' conflict with the city of Wilusa allegedly inspired Homer's Trojan War. Now, for the second question. It's kind of like a trick question, the first one, because uh, that was a valid answer, it was between the two. To allow him to proceed to Troy, Agamemnon sacrificed his daughter Iphigenia to convince which god to allow him to proceed to Troy. Which god did he hit? No, Agamemnon's sacrifice did not appeal to Apollo. Try again. Yes. Agamemnon sacrificed Iphigenia to reconcile with Artemis, who then allowed his ships to pass to Troy. Now, one last question. Last question. What was the name of Agamemnon's Trojan concubine? Oh god, I don't know. Iphigenia was Agamemnon's daughter. Uh, <laughs> that's where I just heard that. I was like, maybe that's it. No. Clytemnistra was Agamemnon. Oh God! Wife. Try a different answer. Correct. Following the sack of Troy, Agamemnon sailed home with the Trojan prophetess named Cassandra. You've studied the ruins well, traveler. I haven't really, but thank you, sir. Well, let's pretend that I learned something. I suppose this is farewell. At least for now. You guys are throwing too much information at me. <laughs> eh. I mean, it wasn't a bad guess to answer chat. Neither of us were. You know, it might not be the exact answer they wanted, but it, it, I mean, it wasn't the worst answer, that's for sure. I'm going to go ahead and do like one, two, three, four, five, like these five discovery points. And then I think uh, we'll end up taking the break because we literally have six minutes till the break right now. So let's knock out these points. And then this way we can go take the break, come back, and uh, we'll continue on. Foundation of the site. Like I said, I kind of wish I played playing this game like once a day, but you know, once on Tuesday, once on Wednesday, once on Thursday, once on Friday. But I'm not really feeling changing the schedule, so I think we're just gonna stay on Assassin's Creed back to back today, because uh, you know, it just it just makes everything too messy at that point. It's a lot easier if we keep it this way for everything. I just leave these screens up so you guys can read them. I also skim through them, but there's just, again, so much info. I don't sit here and try to, like, process every piece of data. I'm already, like, uh, at that point where I'm just, like, oh. It's, like, exactly what happens when I go to, like, museums. And, like, we try to go to multiple museums in a day, and it just never goes well. There's just, you, you can't just, there's no way in hell to, it's not like I have a uh, flash drive plug into my head and you can just look at it and learn it, so. It would be nice, though. <laughs> Just have like a visual memory so you like read something. Just forever remember it. Here we have the cistern. Entrance to the Corbovolta tunnel. Leading to an underground reservoir. Look at that staircase.
Alright, so three more stops, and that'll probably put us at our time limit anyway. My goal is to do all the tours in all the locations. So we did the main story full out, we did all the DLC fully, we did all the side missions for main story and DLC. We did all achievements. I didn't do the uh, the treasure hunting thing where I did that in Origins and it just didn't seem worth it. You literally just go around and find chests. It's nothing phenomenal, trust me. And then uh, the rewards weren't even that special when I did it, so to me that was just done. I also didn't do the DLC mercenaries. I became the top mercenary, which was like level 50, and then they added a few more tiers, but it's just a pain in the ass to go through that, and the rewards just weren't worth it, especially when we're done with the game, pretty much. We got the Cyclopean Wall. Let's take a look at the picture. That's an old-ass picture. Look at that wall. <laughs> they believe Cyclops built the wall. Interesting. I mean, we did fight Cyclopses during the game. So it doesn't really surprise me. That, uh, the picture was real, man. If you're talking about the picture I just showed on the screen. Agamemnon's tomb. Entrance Carter to the real tomb right here. Let's take a look at the picture. Damn. If I really got a chance to go here, I 100% like visit these places if you're allowed to. To me, this is awesome. It's like the old, really old stuff out there. It was part of the fun of going to Rome. You know, we saw the Colosseum and all this stuff. Went down into the catacombs, which is kind of like what you see in like Origins and Odyssey, like the underground burial locations. It's definitely uh, kind of weird, you know, you go to a cemetery, it's the same thing, just completely underground. With people that were there thousands of years ago, so... Is it inside of here? It is. Catholos tombs. Yeah, we have an actual picture of the inside here. Look at that fin stone, like how nicely it's... Looks pretty damn smooth. So the round tomb. Another one done, and we're officially at the two hour mark. So, I think at this point, we're gonna go ahead and go on a uh, 20 to 30 minute break. Let me go ahead and catch up on chat before we go. And yeah, definitely answer Captain Apollo was definitely my choice on that picture. Uh, shout out to Henry, what is up? What's going on? Man, Jay smoke no falling asleep. And, uh, sorry to hear that, Henry. I hope uh, all goes well and she gets better, man. It's definitely not news anybody wants to hear. Send my regards, man. Or wishes, I should say. Hope she gets better. Otherwise, uh, let me just see what's going on. Let's see what characters we got unlocked real quick. We got Layla, Cassandra, Athenian Soldier, Spartan Soldier, Pythag... We could be Pyth Pythagoras or whatever. With the Pythagorean Theorem, man. 
We could put them on a racing horse. <laughs> it looks well together, actually. The next tour that I'm going to do when I get back from the break is uh, we're going to apparently do the Gods of Olympia. Discover Olympia Splendor under the Watchful Eye of the Gods. It's going to be nine stations, 20 minutes long. In two hours, we did, let's see, two, five, five out of 13, 18, 23, 30. Five out of 30 in two hours, so a little bit slow. But I think some of these are only like 10 minutes long, some are 20 minutes long, so you get the idea. We're going to push on and try and get this all done by Thursday and today. The goal is to do absolutely everything this has to offer, all tours and all locations. And that would pretty much close out Odyssey on the channel for good. Unless we decide to do a fun stream sometime on it, like uh, do some of the side missions or something like that. And nice, happy uh, belated birthday to answer chat. But uh, real quick, special thanks to our supporters, our members on the channel, BVT2002, Cam Search by 90 jsmoke 7 and our super chatters, Droughty, Jsmoke, and Rhino60Ping. Appreciate the support. Otherwise, thanks for watching, like, and sub. I'll see you guys in 20 minutes or so, maybe around 445. I'll try to aim for If not, we'll be back by like 450, 455 max. Peace out.
Hey guys, Barry here, back from the break, ready to continue on with the stream. Continuing with Discovery Tour, we got, a uh, not much done, one-sixth of it done in two hours. We did have a slow start, you know, we probably lost about a tour or two of time. So we're going to continue right on just following the suggested path, and, uh, we're going to play for, I'm trying to think, like an hour, 40 minutes or so, and then, uh, probably call it for today. I'll see what the plans are for the rest of the week, and, uh, We'll double check the times for the rest of the week, but I went over the schedule at the beginning of the stream and all that good stuff, as well as yesterday's stream, so refer to that for more info. Otherwise, I'd really appreciate if you like and sub. We also got our website, thegamersociety.com. We got our social and all that good stuff, so be sure to check it out. We also got Patreon membership, Super Chat, if you want to support the channel, other than watching. Even comments on other videos is greatly appreciated, so be sure to uh, take a look at what else we offer. So we're going to go ahead and hop into uh, Mythology Religion here. My goal is to do all the tours and then we'll move into uh, the individual points and just, you know, go as fast through them as we can. Alright, so here we are. <laughs> Changed up our character. So we'll be running Pythag Pythagoras, I think his name is. There are a lot of points around here. But we are all the way over in a city in Elise. So there's plenty we'll be I have to tackle here. Let's go ahead, uh, hop right into the story. Seems like it's a longer one. 21 minutes. Welcome, friend, to this especially sacred part of the Olympian Sanctuary. My name is Varnavas, and I am a ship captain. Don't be fooled by my scarred eye. Though I've seen my share of combat, I mostly stick to trading these days. Well, trading and introducing visitors like you to wonderful sights like this. This place is practically vibrating with divine energy. I feel like if I look over my shoulder right now, Zeus will be staring back at me. The sanctuary of Olympia was dedicated to Zeus, king of the gods. It had close connections to the divine, as you will see very soon. I'll come find you when you're done, and we can talk about what you've learned. So here we go. If we run into uh, purple markers around our tour, we'll probably stop and visit them as well. This workshop was built for the renowned sculptor Phidias after his work on the Acropolis of Athens. In 435 BCE, Phidias came to Olympia to begin working on the great Chrysolophantine statue of Zeus. He died five years later, shortly after completing his masterpiece. This grand statue would become one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Phidias's workshop was located right next to the temple of Zeus. Its structure has been well preserved, mostly owing to its conversion to a church in the fifth century CE. 
Archaeologists have also discovered lots of ancient materials in the surrounding area, such as casting molds and sculpt. The most famous artifact, however, is a cup bearing an inscription that aggressively states, I belong to Phidias. So here we have uh, some sculpting. So you guys can see the background right there. Is real, it's uh, located in the Louvre. On the fifth and final day of the Olympic Games, Victors attended a ceremony where they were crowned with olive wreaths and showered in flowers. The crowns came from the sacred olive tree of Zeus, which was planted near the god's temple. A young boy trimmed the branches with a golden sickle before giving them to the Helenodikai to turn into wreaths. After the crowning ceremony, it was time for great feasting and celebration. the gymnasium picture of athletes and trainers from 5th century the guy on the all the way on the right must be the trainer and everyone else must be the athletes Interesting. Weird stuff going on. There are purple things everywhere, yeah. Full personnel. So this is apparently a sacrificial scene. So we got the legendary victors. There's the real statue right there. Discopolos. There's a Roman copy of a Greek bronze original.
Interesting. There's a lot to uh, read right there if you take the time to pause and read. Kind of like trying to speed read as fast as possible. Picking up the key elements of what we're reading. Heracles stealing the Delphic tripod. Let's move on. We're at uh, tourist station number three. Pelops was both a legendary Greek hero and the mythical founder of the Olympic Games. According to legend, Pelops fell in love with the beautiful Hippodamia. Her father, Oinomaos, the king of Pisa, disapproved of their union. Having once heard a prophecy that he would be killed by his son-in-law, Oinomaos was known to challenge his daughter's suitors to chariot races, killing them when he won. Still, Pelops was determined to win Hippodamia's heart. Before the race, he enlisted the help of Poseidon, who gave him a golden chariot with four winged horses. Pelops was able to win both the race and the hand of his beloved while Oinomaos was dragged to death by his horses. The start of this famous race was depicted on the eastern pediment of the Temple of Zeus. Damn. That's one hell of a story. Let's head on the stage four. The Herion was a temple dedicated to Hera. It is one of the oldest temples in the sanctuary, dating back to approximately 590 BCE. The structure included columns painted with images of women who won the Heraia, an athletic competition made up of running events. Every four years, 16 women were chosen to make a veil dedicated to Hera. These women also organized the competition though they did not compete in it. The Haraya was unique for its focus on female athletes, in contrast to the male-exclusive Olympic Games. Hera was the goddess of women, marriage, family, and childbirth. She ruled Mount Olympus as queen of the gods, along with her husband and brother Zeus. Many mythological stories paint her as being annoyed at Zeus's many lovers and illegitimate offspring. In Greek art, Hera is usually depicted as matronly and regal, often wearing a crown or sitting on a throne. She is also sometimes seen holding a pomegranate, a symbol of both fertility and death. Hera's cult was very popular across Greece, and Olympia even minted her image on its coinage. So if we turn around, there's actually this right here. Got some drachmi. That's a decent quality coin for being so dang old. Here's the info if you're interested to read.
Turkey Rye is open. Right, we can just look at the top of the screen, see where all the purple locations are. So we'll do that from now on, that'll save a little bit of time. One of the highlights of the Olympic Games was a ceremony that took place on the third day of the festival. It began with a procession of athletes, ambassadors, Helenodikai, and animals. The group made their way around the Altis until they arrived at the Temple of Zeus. Then the animals were brought in front of the altar of Zeus and offered as a sacrifice. This sacrifice was known as a hecatome, a word that originally described the sacrifice of 100 oxen. During the hecatome, the bones and legs of the animals were burned and carried to the top of a mound of ashes from previous sacrifices. Meanwhile, the meat of the animals was saved for a large banquet held later in the evening. So, let's continue on. The Olympic Games were dedicated to Zeus, and all the ceremonies and events were hosted in his honor. It is no surprise that the largest temple in the sanctuary was the Temple of Zeus. While most temples were restricted to priests, the Temple of Zeus welcomed all who visited Olympia. This openness was most likely meant to show off the gold and ivory statue of Zeus that stood within the temple's walls. The building also featured art depicting both versions of the Olympic Festival's founding myth. The eastern pediment showed a scene from the legendary race between Pelops and Oinomaos. The temple's metopes, meanwhile, showed the twelve labors of Heracles, the other mythical founder of the games. Bamboosh, instead of running inside, we're actually going to go check out, there's like two purple ones over here. This new story over there, we're not going to do that story till it comes up on the recommended list. So here are some coins. Rating contest, apparently. Here are quite a few sculptures. Oops. Delete the uh, text up. This would be a time where public speaking <laughs> seems uh, mandatory in life. Zeus was the god of sky and thunder and king of the Olympians. He ruled the world from his home on Mount Olympus. The child of Cronus the Titan, Zeus overthrew his father and cast the Titans out in a great battle known as the Titanomachy. He had children of his own with his wife Hera, 
including Ares, Hephaestos, Hebe, and Ilithia. He also had many children without Hera, much to her consternation, but there are too many to list here. Zeus was believed to have control over the lives of mortals, as his many epithets attest to. For example, his title Horkios made him a keeper of oaths, while Xenios was the name conferred to him as a protector of hospitality. In Greek art, Zeus was usually depicted holding a thunderbolt and sitting on a throne, befitting his position as king. God, I didn't want to save that. Seemed like a cool picture spot. How do you get rid of the cycle, the grin? There you go. The Temple of Zeus was home to the Chrysalophantine statue of Zeus one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The statue, made of gold, ivory, and wood, was sculpted by the renowned artist Phidias. At 13 meters tall, it was as impressive looking as it was difficult to maintain. Oil was used to protect the wood and ivory from cracking and to prevent general decay. While the statue does not exist today, it was thankfully described by Pausanias in great detail so its legacy lives on. Guess it was a uh, temporary build. Oh god, the quiz. It's probably what I say every time we do a quiz now. Just not ready for any quizzes, but we gotta do the quiz because it, uh, it's definitely fun to see what you retain. Sometimes you do terrible, sometimes you do great. This is a long one, so we'll see how it goes. As close as a mortal can get. Is there anything else you'd like to do? Excellent. Let's see what you remember. Your first question is a simple one. Which goddess was Zeus's wife? Pretty sure. Not only was Ida Zeus's wife, she was his sister as well. But let's move on to the next question. What <laughs> kind of contest did Pelops win in his quest to marry Hippodamia? Yes, Pelops Cherry won race. the chariot race, thanks to Poseidon's help. And now, the final question. What was inscribed on the cup found near Thivia's workshop? He yeah, wrote... Along the Fidia. Correct. Apparently, Phidias was very possessive of his things. Perhaps someone from the sanctuary kept stealing them. But I'm getting off track. Excellent work, friend. You honor the gods with your great wisdom. Farewell for now, my friend. So. I do look at like the whole map data, which only counts by region. I wish it would show more than that. Either way, we're all the way over here in Ellis. There's quite a few things. These all seem like they'll be part of this one. The Olympic Games story, so maybe we'll, because there's the Olympic Game thing, we'll probably walk around there. Let's get these four up here. Maybe those six, and then we'll move on to the next story. Let's figure while we're here, let's get it, get some of them done. It'll give us a break from uh, story to story. I was thinking the other way, do these at the end, but I feel like they're helpful because they give you a break from all the info you're obtaining. So you do one, you go around, collect what you can around there, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. The organization. I 
Athlete getting crowned. We're gonna see the progress. But like absolutely all of it. There's like 30 stories, so. Right, a lot more of these things. side. See where we're going next. Hit, uh, there's only like two more to go. We might as well just get him. The one's a little bit further, but we can call our horse in. Adios. Probably saying it wrong.
Well, there's two more to get. If this takes more than eight hours, we'll have to figure it out. I don't mind holding off on Destiny 2 DLC to the start Goat Streak on Breakpoint of San Andreas. But we do need to finish out Rage 2, Terramania, Star Wars Battlefront 2, and all that stuff, so... Let's go ahead and hop in the next one. This one's Kronos. Worthy of a screenshot. There's like nothing else close enough to warrant going any more out of our way. So behind the scenes forts, discovery site tour. It's one of the hilltop forts. Next recommended tour is the Agora of Athens. It's a 23 minute 11 station tour.
So sorry about that. Uh, my cable, I got stuck under the chair there for a sec. Sorry if you're hearing any static. Let's go ahead and uh, do this one. This one's going to be pretty long as well. Another 23 minute one, a lot of info to cover. Greetings, Wanderer, and welcome to the Ag... I love this Agora. Where else could you find a common fish merchant and an extravagant jewelry seller within a few feet of each other? It's that kind of variety that makes city life so rich and exciting. The Agora is the beating heart of any Greek city. It is a place where all types of people may gather, from citizens and foreigners to magistrates and philosophers. All manner of business is conducted here, including political meetings, legal proceedings, and trade. When you finish exploring, come find me, and we can talk more. See you soon, Wanderer. So here we are. Digor of Ath. The Agora was the civic center of Athens, but it wasn't only frequented by politicians and city officials. The area housed a market where people could purchase food and other goods from merchants. It was also frequented by philosophers who used the public space to establish schools and pass on their teachings to students. Religion had its place as well. Temples dedicated to Hephaestus and Apollo were located in the Agora, along with the altar of the 12 gods and the monument of the eponymous heroes. Oh, we got a few of these little things, so we'll stop and see what's up. Stoa of Zeus. So here's another Zeus coin. They've already showed us quite a few of these, so quickly move on. We got the Minotaur fraud from that apparently. Here's Apollo. So this is where decisions start again make. Interesting. And this is also a bronze statue at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Gonna have to uh, get up there and go see this stuff in person. I've been running party on this whole time. I think the party crashed while we were on break, so... Here you have Thesis, slaying a centaur. See there in the picture, there he is, slaying one. Take no bullshit. Save 
save the eponymous heroes. Oh, look at this. Oh. Is this where the wall used to be or something? This is where the wall used to be. Oh god, we're surrounded by stuff we can do. The one to the left doesn't even show up, so we're gonna just head back. This one over here will hit on the way back. Altar of the Twelve Gods. In the background's a real altar, apparently. Twenty seventy six discovery sites in this dang region. There's so many. The painted stoa, or stoa poikile, derived its name from the panel paintings on its wall. The paintings were created in the fifth century BCE by famous artists like Polygnotus and depicted Greek military victories like the Battle of Marathon. The Stoa served as a public meeting place for citizens, but it was especially popular with philosophers who used the space to pass on their teaching. In 301 BCE, the philosopher Zeno of Kition chose the Stoa Poikile as the location for his school of philosophy, the appropriately dubbed Stoicism. So we've only done two tour stations of 11. We've got a lot to see here. Trade in the Agora was supervised by magistrates. There were five Agoranomoi who kept order in the market controlled the quality of goods, and collected market dues. This provided revenue to the city and helped pay the magistrates and those in charge of maintaining order. The market benefited everyone. Customers bought what they needed, merchants made their living, and city officials received the money they needed to keep the wheels of democracy turning. I'm not here to hear the story again. We're here to uh, just see the uh, the picture. Trade in the group of bakers needing bread. Was supervised there with the mark. I'm just gonna skip the whole thing. Moving on. The original temple of Apollo Patroas was built around 535 BCE by Pisistratos, but was destroyed by the Persians during their invasion a few decades later. It long remained in ruins, except for the altar, which was left standing as a reminder of the Persian sacrilege. Eventually, a new temple was built in the fourth century BCE. Inside was a statue made by Euphranor, the same artist who painted in the Stoa of Zeus. The temple held special significance in Athens as it was connected to the origin of the city's people. The name Patroos, meaning fatherly, 
referenced the belief that Apollo was the father of Eon, founder of the Ionian Greeks, from whom all Athenians are descended. The temple of Hephaestus overlooks the Agora from the Colonus Agoraeus Hill. Today, it is one of the best preserved temples in Greece, owing to its conversion to a church in the Middle Ages. But while this transformation preserved the structure, it also damaged the surrounding sculptures. The temple was dedicated not only to Hephaestus, the god of metallurgy, but also to Athena Ergane, goddess of arts and crafts. Nearly every part of the Hephaestion was lavishly decorated with depictions of famous mythological events, like the labors of Theseus. The Theseus scenes gave the temple the nickname Theseion, a name that lives on today as a city district in Athens. Hey. Try this picture, uh... The Bulaterion was another building in the Agora that contributed to the democratic process. It housed the Athenian Council of Citizens, the Boule. This council of 500 was composed of 50 members from each Greek tribe, all of whom served a one-year term. They were chosen by lot from among citizens over 30. Every month, one group of 50 was chosen to lead the Boule's executive committee, the Pritinaes. The Pritaneus met every day of the month and called meetings of the full council in the Bulaterion, where they spent their time discussing bills. Oh my god. You move away like an inch too far and it just uh, ends. That's how doing that. Here's the learn more page. Conversation scene. It's located in the uh, Louvre. Nice long reading for you guys. was another building in the Agora. It, this count... Let's move on, next point. The Neon was one of the most important buildings in the Agora, as it was the headquarters of the Pritaneus. The Pritaneus 
was the executive committee of the Boule, who ran the city's daily operations. The Pritaneus dined in the Pritaneum, and 17 of them slept on site to ensure there were always officials available to deal with emergencies. The Pritaneum also housed the official weights and measures of the city. The fire of Hestia, which provided sacred fire for all public sacrifices, was also located there. Let's see. Next one. The Heliaia was the most important court in Athens and was presided over by a group of judges called Heliasts. Judging was a regular part of an Athenian citizen's life with trials happening almost every day. Heliasts were chosen randomly based on two factors. First, that they were on the official list of 6,000 potential Heliasts. Second, that they were present at court on the day of the trial. A stipend of two obols was established by Pericles to compensate for the loss of work while on Helias duty, and also to encourage participation in the judiciary process. So, here's Helios Tablet bearing his name. The Heliaia was the most important court in Athens and was presided over by a group of judges called Heliasts. Judging was a regular part of an Athenian citizen's life with trials happening almost every day. Heliasts were chosen randomly based on two factors. First, that they were on the official list of 6,000 potential Heliasts. So, so, continue on. In the Agora, an Athenian could buy and sell many different products. The permanent retail market was divided into sections according to the category of merchandise. Merchants and craftsmen who worked in the market could be citizens, foreigners, or even freed slaves. They sold everything from food and clothes to jewelry and slaves. With so much variety, competition was fierce and that competition helped regulate the market's prices. Here's a Greek scale from 5th to 1st century. Interesting information. There's only two more uh, stations. Well, they're planned to end by 6.30. We got about 45 minutes left. So we can do another one or two. See what happens. Follow the recommended path after these. Uh, we'll see how we do on the quiz. 
There's a lot of information on this one, but it's a lot of basic information. The Io wasn't the only court in Athens. This other court was located next to the South Stoa. Historians believe it to be a court based on the discovery of a nearby box containing seven bronze ballots. These ballots were used by jurors to give their verdicts. The reason trials were so common in Athens might have been related to their democratic regime, which promoted the individual's right to demand reparations for injustice. However, not all legal matters were settled in this fashion. If a claim was small enough, it was settled individually by a magistrate. Public trials were reserved for more serious offenses, such as murder, theft, and political crimes. So here we have a uh, bust of Socrates. I think this is part of the final Lost Tales of, of Greece uh, mission. He was executed. Hemlock, that's the question. Right, we're like surrounded by uh, purple ones, so we're gonna pit stop and see. We got trials over here with the trials of Sophocles, an oil painting located in Paris. Uh, hit these two spots over here real quick. Uh, Sal Stoa. Most of a terracotta figurine of a banqueter. Sixteen rooms in there, geez. Apparently dining halls possibly. purple one right here. Apparently this is called the Fountain House. Here's a black figure, Hydraea, a scene of women at a fountain house. was where the city made its coinage. It is believed that Athens' mint was in the city's agora, as modern excavations have turned up small disc-shaped pieces of metal used to make coins. Much of the silver required for minting coinage came from the Lavrion silver mines. Athens was so dependent on the mines that when they lost them during the Peloponnesian War, the city was forced to melt down a gold statue of Athena to mint gold coins and avert a monetary crisis. Here's the coins. Obviously, 
Here's another coin. There's the owl on the right. Time to say our quiz. Everybody ready for this? You have now experienced the Agora, following in the footsteps of countless Athenians before you. I hope the trip has impressed upon you how important this place was to trade, politics, and law. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Very well, let's begin. Which philosopher's school took its name from the painted stoa? Oh, man. Valis had an obsession with water, which he believed made up all matter in the world. He also lived a full lifetime before the Pikili stoa was constructed. Try again. I have no idea, I don't remember. I don't think it's Socrates. Socrates was one of the greatest minds in Greece. But there are no records of him teaching at the painted stoa. Try a different answer. Yes. There we go, Zeno. <laughs> Third time to try. He and his followers were dubbed Stoics. Time for another question. What other name has the Iphistion gone by? Correct. The that name was, was inspired by the scenes showing the hero Theseus, which decorate the temple. Only one question left. When Athens lost the Lavrion silver mines during the Peloponnesian War, which statue did they melt down to mint new coins? I have no idea. <laughs> there was a statue of Apollo Patros in the Agora, but it was made from limestone and thus could not be melted into metal coins. Try again. Uh, Athenians used the monument of Eponymos heroes as a notice board, but its statues were not melted for minting material. Keep trying. Correct! The Athenians melted down a statue of Athena to mint gold coins. It's clear you are very familiar with the Agora of Athens. I'm impressed. Farewell, Wanderer. May we see each other again soon. See ya. Uh... Let's run and get that one, then we'll do the next story. Gives me a, a few minute break to like... That was a bad run. A few bad answers, but those were some tough questions. There was a lot of data covered in that tour. Like a lot of data. And we decided to add more data in, which I think is what screwed me. Maybe we should do the tours and then run around and do the other things, but like, do them together. We do a full straight through and then we stop and we go around the same area completing the other stuff in the same spot. This way we don't have to go back to the same spot five times to make sure we get everything. The Garden of Hephaestus. Flarmor. Return of Hephaestus to Olympos in the background. Who do we got now? It should be the Minotaur fraud. I wish you use a... Uh... We'll keep the racing horse for now. Next I recommend we do the Oracle of Delphi. It's about 7 stations, 14 minutes.
So, this is in focus. Oracle Delphi, let's start. Here, visitor, and welcome to this sacred site. Delphi is an amazing place to visit if you're looking for information. I've come here on several occasions in search of answers to some particularly puzzling questions. And sometimes, I even found them. This is Delphi, home of the renowned oracle. Greeks considered it the navel of the world. Pilgrims and kings journeyed here from all over Greece and beyond, seeking advice from Apollo through the voice of his interpreter, Pythia. During your visit, you will experience the sanctuary through a pilgrim's eye and discover how important oracles and prophecies were to the people of Greece. Now, go off and begin your pilgrimage. I will be waiting for you at the end of your visit. On their journey to the Temple of Apollo, pilgrims walked this sacred path up Mount Parnassus. The summer sun beat down hot on their backs. Along the way, they took in the magnificent monuments, treasuries, and statues that adorned the road. These landmarks were tokens of people's reverence for the Oracle's benevolence. All were dedicated to Apollo, and most were offered by cities to commemorate military victories. The monuments represented not only their donors' piety, but also their power and wealth. The sanctity of Delphi has endured to the present day, and visitors still take this very same route. Quite a lot of statues. We messed up and I uh, got distracted because I wanted to see what the statues look like. So let's open this up. We got the Delphi Sanctuary of Apollo map, it seems. Pilgrims walked. I've already seen this. Let's uh, push it on. Six more stations to go. And we're going to hit, I guess, these as well. Monument of Epigonus. The Oath of the Seven Leaders before Thebes. Sikionian treasure. Here's a coin. I have a feeling we're gonna make our way up here. Let's just go back down. We'll hit those as we get to them. I have a feeling we're gonna head up that way. That's the way to the top, I'm pretty sure.
One of the most impressive dedications to Apollo came from the Canidians, a Greek population that colonized the island of Lipari, north of Sicily. The story behind this dedication is notable. The Canidians were at war with the Etruscans in the Tyrrhenian Sea. Seeking a good omen, the Canidians consulted the Oracle, and following her advice, they successfully captured 20 enemy ships. To thank Apollo, they offered the god the same number of statues as ships seized. So, you have a bronze statue of Apollo right here. Now we're going to head right up here. Athenian treasury. Here's a picture of the real thing. It's pretty cool. Move on. Next, the Boletarion of Delphi. There, uh, in the background, there's more coinage. Oh, between 600 and 550 BCE, you read the rest. It may be in poor condition, but I mean, who's surprised? It's been like 3,000, 20, yeah, 2,300 years old. <laughs> yeah, if it was still standing strong, I mean, we would have solved the uh, building quality long ago. Here is the Cybill Rock. Seems like a rock up on the hill. Cybill Delphi oil painting. Located in Paris. Where is she like hiding? She delivered her prophecies from atop the stone. Next to the Naxian Sphinx stood a simple structure to display offerings from the Athenians, most of which were spoils of war. In particular, these offerings, called ex votos, were prows of sunken Persian ships. The Athenians built the portico after their naval victory over the Persians in 478 BCE. So let's follow the road, just looking around the top bar, looking where each direction goes, like trying to be as efficient as possible with this. Oh, God. <laughs> Apollo Salamini. Salamini. How are you going to say it? It's the Battle of Salamini. Salamina. I get you butchering the shit out. But there you have it, that's the painting. Once arriving before the temple, pilgrims wishing to consult the oracle had to first pay a tax. This tax gave them the initial right to approach the altar of Apollo and make an animal sacrifice to the god. But before proceeding to the Pythia, the preliminary ritual had to succeed. 
If the animal reacted favorably and showed signs of acceptance to the god, it was sacrificed, and the pilgrim would be allowed to enter the temple to question the Pythia. The Sphinx and Oedipus. We fought a uh, Sphinx and Origins for those who missed that. At last, we arrive at the Temple of Apollo, where the Oracle relayed her prophecies. The temple was the final destination of those seeking an audience with the Pythia, and its appearance matched the majesty of its purpose. Atop its imposing columns, the structure's pediments displayed famous mythological scenes sculpted by the renowned Greek artist Antenor. But as grand as the temple looked from the outside, it paled in comparison with what happened within. Apparently this is a real picture. Prophecies were given in the most restricted part of the temple, the Aditum, by a chaste woman known as the Pythia. Before delivering prophecies, she first purified herself with water, then burned laurel leaves and barley flour to begin the ritual. Finally, while seated on a tripod surrounded by offerings, the Pythia delivered Apollo's messages. Her words were often strange and indecipherable and required further interpretation by the temple's priests. Despite much research, the exact causes of the oracle's behavior while prophesying are debated to this day. And we have to learn more. Myths say that while searching for an oracle who could impart their words to mortals, Apollo established a sanctuary on Mount Parnassos. Apollo took over this site by slaying its sinister guardian, the snake-like Pytho. I think it's a quiz time. Your visit is complete. I hope you now understand how important this sanctuary was and how it affected the lives of people both in the Greek world and beyond its borders. To be honest, I could speak about Delphi all day. But what would you like to do now? 
You wish to test your knowledge. Let's begin with a simple question. What did the Oracle use to purify herself before her predictions? The Greeks used olive oil for things like meat oh, and medicine, but it was not required to purify the Oracle. Try again. Try animal blood. <laughs> were required to see the oracle their blood was not used in the purification ritual try another answer correct the oracle used water for purification time for another question which god was believed to speak through the oracle at delphi yes the oracle allegedly spoke the words of apollo which well, that wasn't difficult by priests one final question for you Delphi is situated on which mountain? Correct. Delphi stood on the slope of Mount Heard the name pop up. Well done, traveler. Your knowledge rivals that of the wisest philosophers. As you wish. It has been a pleasure sharing Delphi with you. So we finished that. Still a few more things we can hit around here. Three more. We're going to be getting off pretty soon. I'm not sure if we'll have enough time for any more tours at this point. So it's the theater of Delphi up here. Now we have the tripod of Plataya, however you say that. And there's one more location, I think, here. Yep, 38 meters up here. Apparently it's the Battle of Marathon. Seems to be all there is right in this region. There's seven more in the overall area, but it's for another time. Completed eight of, uh, I think, 30 total tours. Yep, eight of 30. So, quite a bit. The next one's a 13 minute, nine station one for uh, Port City. I guess we have time for this final one since it's 6.18, I went into 6.30, so let's hurry up and go to it. This will be the final tour of today. Be continuing on Thursday in two days.
So now we're down to port. Final one we're going to do. Greetings, Wanderer, and welcome to the port of Pireves. Pireves is one of the busiest, most important ports in the Greek world. Money flows through here like a river. A river that runs all the way to Athens. Acting as a port for Athens, Pireves welcomed merchants, goods, and travelers from all over the world. It was a central part of Athens' economy, but it was also fortified enough to protect the city's considerable fleet. When you finish exploring the port, find me, and we will talk further. For the final one, I'll change the character real quick. Let's see. Here, we can play as Phoebe. RIP Phoebe in the actual game. A peninsula southwest of Athens became the city's main port after the politician Themistocles encouraged the development of its natural harbors. These developments led to the gradual abandonment of the older harbor of Phaleron. Piraeus's fortifications were further developed by Chemon and Pericles, along with the long walls, which ensured goods could still be moved during sieges. Piraeus was divided into three main sectors, the military port, the emporion, and the residential area. By the fifth century BCE, it had become not only Athens' naval headquarters, but also the mercantile center of the Mediterranean. Stop over here for the little side piece. Apparently on merchant ships. This is from the Louvre. Piraeus' development during the 5th century BCE attracted a large population. Many craftsmen, merchants, bankers, sailors, and ship owners moved to the port in great numbers. The population was a mix of Greek citizens, foreign visitors, and immigrants known as metics. The variety of the port's inhabitants gave Piraeus a cosmopolitan atmosphere. Most of the residents were involved in trade, but others worked on shipbuilding or in larger scale industries like shield factories. Piraeus's commercial focus offered many opportunities for those seeking to increase their wealth and status. One such rags to riches tale is that of Passion, a slave who eventually became a citizen and earned a fortune thanks to his bank and his shield factory. Piraeus was a demi, or district, of Attica. Because of its size, function, and varied population, it had a much more complicated administrative structure than other deems. Above all, Piraeus was closely monitored and controlled by the Athenian assembly due to its importance to the city. Within the port, there were two separate categories of trade, 
international trade, which took place in the Emporion, and retail trade, which was managed by Kapaloi in Piraeus's Agora. Actually, I skipped to learn more. Hold on. We'll bring it up in a second. Of course, I'm going to take forever to load, so just bear with me. Piraeus was a demi. So here it is, a terracotta figurine of a merchant selling bread. Or district of Attica because of its size. So we already listened to this one. Let's close it. Within but had to show it. There were two sep and so we have a one of the alternative ones. We'll get it later. The Emporion was a commercial port dedicated to trading goods from overseas. All international transactions were required to be made within its limits and needed to be exclusively wholesale. Elected magistrates managed all business and laws in the port. Meanwhile, port authorities known as Epimelites oversaw trade and took care of the regulation of prices. This was an especially crucial duty as the amount of supplies and goods could fluctuate wildly based on factors like bad harvests or lost cargo. Common products sold in the Emporion included vegetables, fruits, fish, leather, timber, marble, metal, weapons, and ceramics. According to Hermippos, Athens was also wealthy enough to afford the finest goods from, including figs from Rhodes, almonds from Thassos, oil from Samos, and wine from Chios. Taxes were collected on all merchandise that came into the Emporion, which provided Athens with a major source of income. After arriving in the Emporion, merchants set up samples of their goods in a display area called the Deigma. This was where citizens and foreigners gathered to officially make their deals. And almost all merchandise that came into the Emporion was traded within the area. The Deigma was under constant supervision by magistrates who negotiated price control with the importers. They would occasionally give special privileges to those who agreed to sell at lower prices. These privileges ranged from tax exemptions to specially reserved seating in the theater. Damn, in the seat hookup. So here's the black figure scene. The background, making trades. I'm just gonna check something on the map. Which was a bunch of discovery sites, uh, pretty much all around here. Let's just continue on. We have, uh, four more stations. After these four stations are done, that'll be it for today's stream. It's been uh, definitely a long stream. Piraeus was a, a lot of info. 
and as such was supervised by a magistrate called the De Marcos. While most De Marcoi were chosen locally within their deem, Piraeus was appointed directly by Athens, so the city could better monitor its commercial interests. In fact, matters regarding the Emporion, the military harbor, and the grain trade were regularly debated and decided by the Athenian assembly. Transactions within the Piraeus were supervised by metronomoi. These were magistrates responsible for keeping track of weights and measure. They made sure merchants' measurements were always accurate to prevent bad deals and scams. Even though Piraeus would eventually develop into a city in its own right, it always remained under the control of Athens. So here we have Bronze Wade of one Mina. So interesting for sure right there, drop me in like a square shape. A commercial tax of 2% or a pentecost was placed on all cargo entering and leaving Piraeus. The tax was collected by a group of five people called Pentecostologoi. According to Andocides, this position could be bought for the hefty sum of 30 talents, or 180,000 drachmae. However, most of these officials made a profit of up to six talents, making the job very lucrative. While merchants were responsible for setting the value of their goods, Pentecostal Logoi had the power to challenge the value, if they saw fit. Furthermore, merchants were required to register with these officials before they could transport, display, and sell their goods. Overall, this system provided Piraeus, and by extension Athens, with a tremendous amount of money. See why they uh, held on tight. The sale of grain was overseen by special magistrates called Sitophilikeis. Since some Greek cities had a grain deficiency and relied heavily on imports, these officials were extremely important. Their duties encompassed all aspects of grain commerce, including price control and profit margins, to ensure Athens remained well fed. This is no surprise. Grain was so important to Athens that two-thirds of all stocks were required to be transported and sold at the city's agora by law. According to Demosthenes, the significance of the Sitophilikes was such that if they failed in their duties, they faced the death penalty. Well, here we go. We have a uh, ear of barley from the stater. I do want to say I realize we skipped the last one as well, so we'll go back. But the Peloponnesian War saw some changes in how bread to produce and consumed. Interesting little coin they had there. Came back just so we can uh, click A and see the info. A commercial. So here's Larmore. It's a uh, red figure, bleak with a scene of a man in front of a woman holding a hydrea. of 2%. Let's move on to the next one. I believe it's the final station, then we'll take the quiz. Which will probably bomb anyway. I 
I hope you guys enjoyed the stream so far, though. Back at it on Thursday. Hopefully, I'll uh, get as much as done possible Thursday. If we need more time for this game, we'll consider uh, either pushing in the next week or juggling something around. We'll figure it all out. No big deal. The Emporion operated on a foundation of credit and loans. Overseas commerce was handled by two types of tradespeople. Emporoi transported cargo in borrowed ships, while Nauklaroi were ship owners who moved goods on their own vessels. Elsewhere in the Emporion were bankers and accountants who arranged loans and kept track of incoming and outgoing ships. Emporoi and Nauklaroi financed their maritime voyages with these loans, which often had a high interest rate due to the dangers of sea travel. Emporoi used the loans to pay for both the cargo and the right to a ship, while Nauklaroi only had to pay for their crew. Loans and interest were repaid upon a ship's return to port. However, in the event of a catastrophe such as a shipwreck, the merchant and ship owner were released from their obligations, and the losses were transferred to the lender. Just basically, the lender had to take a gamble. Teeny and direct me with a teeny and oh, there, and now in the reverse. Six percent interest rate, man. Final quiz of today, and then we're gonna get off. You've returned. So I've had enough. I hope you enjoyed your stroll through the port. Piraeus was important to Athens' commercial interests, but it eventually came into its own as a vibrant and bustling port. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. If you say so, let us see what you've learned, wanderer. First, a simple question. Which Athenian politician originally encouraged the development of Piraeus' natural harbors? So... I think it was Themistocles. Correct. Themistocles saw Piraeus' potential as a port and encouraged its development. On to the next question. What did the city of Philake supervise? No. The aptly oh. named oh, yeah, yeah, that was it. Collected the Pentecosti tax. Try another answer. I thought that was wrong, but I wanted to take a chance. I'm gonna guess it's weight of measures or grain commerce. It was Metronomy who were in charge of Pirates. Metronomy. Oh, Try God. Again. So many confusing names I never heard. Yes. There we go, grain. Had the extremely important responsibility of handling all matters related to grain commerce. Only one question left. What was the name of the slave who took advantage of Piraeus' opportunities to earn themselves citizenship? Oh, uh, we can't forget this person. They were awesome. I think it was Passion. Correct. Passion managed to Passion. earn a fortune and achieve citizenship thanks to both his bank and a successful shield business. Your knowledge of Piraeus is impressive. Well done, Wanderer. As you wish. Thank you for visiting. Well, with that tour complete, there's another tour down. And, I believe, possibly the end of our stream. Next time, we'll start with the Sanctuary of Esclusbios at Edaras. We have, a uh, three... We have nine out of thirty complete, so we're about a third done. Uh, so we'll see how it goes next time. Either way, we still have a lot to do in the overall map. I kind of wish they could give us a number for the entire map, not just one area. So, you know, we have four tours here. Yeah, tour here, tour there. Discovery sites all over Lesbos. Plenty of places we'll have to go. We'll have to do all the discovery points and all of the, uh, the tours. And once we complete everything this has to offer, that'll be it for the game. As mentioned on the base game, all I skipped out on were the, uh, the puzzles to locate gear and stuff, which I'm never going to do, and then to the uh, mercenaries beyond becoming the top mercenary, the ones that added DLC, which I just didn't care to do.
because the rewards weren't worth it and I was pretty much done with the game and was ready to move on, so. At that point, I'm just, I'm not going to go back for the mercenaries or those, and I'm, I will finish out this fully, though, uh, so. You can expect it on Thursday, and we'll see what happens. If we have to, we'll consider pushing it in the next week, and we skip Destiny 2 and finish this instead, and juggle the other DLC, so all we have left is Destiny 2 the week after, and that would kind of work out perfectly. We'll see what happens, no guarantees. We won't play next week until the weekend, so uh, we'll see what happens. Shout out to our members on the channel though, BBT2002, Cam Certified 90, J Smoke 87, and our super chatters, Drought C, J Smoke, and Ryan 60 Ping, appreciate the support. Otherwise, thanks for watching, like and sub, see you guys tomorrow for Rage 2 Rise of the Ghost, back to back all afternoon, finish out the DLC in entirety. Peace out!